Hey everyone, it's Tom Kradza, and on this episode of the Your Life, Your Terms show, we brought in Kelly Hawks, who's an absolute pit bull in the legal world. She is a paralegal that we have used in the past ourselves for various different things, real estate and otherwise. And the reason we brought her on to this episode of the show is we wanted to go through how to properly and professionally evict a tenant in Ontario. We get this asked a lot and it usually comes from two places that an investor is scared to invest in their very first property because they're scared and they've heard horror stories of dealing with tenants and most of that kind of stuff is false which we address in this episode or they just don't know the process in general like they have no clue of how the process works and they're an existing landlord and really just don't understand how you go about it so we cover everything we try to start from the very beginning until the very end of the process. And we did our best to cover all the little questions and angles that might come up when you're evicting a tenant. And absolute, there's absolute endless amount of different things that can happen when you're renting out property. So we didn't cover every imaginable situation that can occur, but we wanted to cover most of the stuff that happens. And if you have never been through this process, you should understand that whenever a tenant eviction story hits, you know, one of the newspapers in Canada or in the Toronto area, it's always the absolute horror stories. Generally, when you're following the process, process, it is pretty well laid out. So really, this is our attempt to share that process. Even if you're an experienced landlord, I think you'll pick up some tips and some ideas from Kelly. She addresses some concepts that I wasn't really aware of myself, never had to deal with it. So it was good to hear from that. So I really think you'll pick up a lot of different things from listening to Kelly's discussion through this. This is maybe one of our less um, informal talks. You know, we usually just have informal talks on this podcast. This is a little more structured to us trying to get through um, an actual topic from start to finish. That sounds funny. We should probably try to get through actual top topics most of the time on this podcast, but that's generally not how we operate. We usually just have discussions that go all over the place. So it sounds funny to describe that. And listen, if you are listening to this, over the next few years, it is going to get crazier with rental properties and tenants in Ontario. And I just want to explain something. There isn't a population explosion going on in this area. You can get our latest report, Ontario's Population Explosion, the untold story at rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash reports. You should check out some of the data that's happening here. I think all landlords, all investors should be aware of this information and it is stuff that doesn't seem to be discussed in the media very often, but it's going to greatly affect the real estate demand in this area over the next 10 years. So if you're, you've, you've been investing for five or 10 years and you think prices are already getting crazy or demand is already get, get, getting crazy, wait for the next 10 years. I mean, we really feel with the economic policies that are in place and the demand that's coming our way, this is going to be really interesting as a real estate investor. So there's great opportunity ahead. Um, and now just to switch back to the topic of this podcast, I just want to explain something really clearly is that we believe whenever you're dealing with tenants, we always have to honor tenants. They, you know, they have families that are always good people. So in no way, shape or form is this episode about how to evict a tenant improperly. This discussion is to handle evictions, you know, with class, properly, professionally, ethically. And that's why we're trying to share this information so that everyone is aware of how the Tenant Act works here in, in Ontario specifically and how we are all to abide by it. So hopefully you get a lot of good juicy details from this. And listen, if you are listening to this and you think this podcast and you think we've earned a review on iTunes or a rating on iTunes, please go over to iTunes and give us that. That means our, the world to us. Any feedback that you think we may have earned, if you can give it to us on iTunes, it really means a lot to us. It's kind of like the juice that really makes this whole thing flow. So thank you in advance. If you think we've earned that, we can ask that from you. Thank you for that. And that's it. With that, let's get on with the show. Are you ready to live life on your terms? Is it time to take charge? Real estate, business building, the economy, health and nutrition, and more. It's the Your Life, Your Term Show with Tom and Nick Carazza. Are you ready? Let's go. Okay, now we are live. This is attempt number two. And yeah, we are good with Kelly Hawks. And I was just saying, saying that Kelly is a great person because Kelly represented our father. And for the, no one here knows our father, but our father is an older European dude who came over, who thinks he always has the right answers and really doesn't have a lot of patience. And I have no, to this day, I don't know how you 
represented him. I think it was over <laughs> collections on some job he did. Yeah. Um, that, that was it, right? Yeah. And uh, ever since you did that, because I think that was our first like actual business transaction together, mm-hmm. um, that I, I was impressed. I'm like, okay, if she, if she can handle our dad, then she <laughs> knows what she's doing. And I think you, you guys won. I don't even remember. You guys won. He was, all I know is he was happy. And for our dad to be happy, because he's the kind of guy that since I was born to love, about I had my son. I didn't really see him smile. <laughs> when he had my son. He started smiling all of a sudden. But uh, anyway, no, that was good. He, he was happy with the results. So he that's was good. he was happy. But uh, yeah. so on this, we want to walk through how to like professionally and properly, not maliciously or anything, how to do an eviction in Ontario. We get asked that all the time. I'm sure you get asked that all the time. I do. Yeah. So I kind of want to just go through this process so that anyone listening to this knows what they need to do. And we're going to try and lay it out so anyone can do it by themselves. And then we'll talk about some of the options in Ontario where if you just don't have the time, how you can hire someone and do all that. But, um, you know, we'll just jump in instead of going through your history. I'm just going to tell everyone Kelly has a lot of experience and you should trust her. We're just going to leave it at that. Okay. That's good. Can we begin with... If someone, you know, how does it usually start? Does it start when someone, or clear this up for me, someone, it's the first of the month, somebody doesn't pay, and it's the morning of the second of the month. Okay. Is that the beginning of a typical non-payment of rent eviction process? Um, In most cases, yes. In some cases, there's uh, terms in the lease agreements, if they're older lease agreements, that say that the third day is considered late rent. I've come across that a number of times, but for the most part, it's the second day of the month. Um, (laughs) I say for the most part because some people start their leases mid-month, and instead of doing a prorated amount to the end of a month and then starting again on the first, they have their rent cycle due on the 15th of every month. So let's say if the rent isn't paid on the date that the first date of the rental cycle, then the next day is considered late. Okay. And then in the new Ontario standard lease agreement, is it the second Again, you, some people start them midway, but you're supposed to do okay, a so prorated it, okay. amount until the beginning of the next rent cycle, which would be on the first of the month. Okay, but in the new lease, uh, the Ontario Standard Lease Agreement that we can all Google up and mm-hmm. download and use, um, mm-hmm. it there's no like wait two or three days, no, like you mentioned in some older right. leases. It is like the day after whenever you're supposed to have paid. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then how does it, so that happens, I wake up on the day after they're supposed to have paid And what is the first step? Well, I always, always, always tell everybody to use the tools that they have. And the one tool that you must use if the rent isn't paid is the N4 notice. And that should be prepared and served on the day after rent is due if it has not been paid. Even if it's been paid partially, you can still include the partial payment in the N4. I've always in my past in property management and now as a representative, um, told everybody that that's the tool that you must use. And I still find that people aren't utilizing it. I get people who, you know, haven't paid rent for three, their tenant hasn't paid rent for maybe three months and they don't know what to do. So N4 on the day after the note, uh, the the rent hasn't been paid. And if you want to look at the N4, you can just Google up like landlord, tenant board, N4, something like the forms. Yeah. Yeah. Like the N4, even in Google, if you just put in like N4 form, you're going to find, you're going to find it. And there's a nice PDF, which is the instructions for exactly how to uh, fill it out. Yep. And I just want to comment on that point because that's like the first thing we see beginner investors make a mistake is that they typically buy into the story that the tenant is telling them. That's right. And whenever I hear stories of like, oh, it takes like eight months to evict somebody. And we all read the Toronto Star articles mm-hmm. of the horror stories. Yes. But in general, if you follow the process, it doesn't take eight months. It's usually the investor or landlord's fault because they bought into whatever story their tenant is yeah. telling them. And sometimes out of genuine kindness, which I can understand. Yeah. Um, but when you go two or three or four months, it almost becomes more difficult to go down the process because when we've done that, because mm-hmm. we've made those mistakes, when you then start the N4 process, because then it's a form that gets mailed out, yep. it gets everyone's back up. two weeks. Yeah, yeah it, it gets everyone's back up. You're like, oh, yep. well, you know what? I thought we had an agreement while yep. we were waiting. So if you just on the first time they're late, you say, hey, listen, you know, I understand you're going to be able to pay me in two or three weeks because that's usually what you hear. Yep. That's all good. However, I run this I like a business. Yeah. And I if you want to blame your brother, which is who I blame, 
I'm like, hey, I run this like if it was me, I wouldn't do this. But yeah. my brother, I mean, he'll just have my back. You know, he'll have my head if, if I, I don't uh, serve the notice. Yeah, if I don't serve the notice. Yeah. So if you want to just play good cop, bad cop, you can do that. Yeah. Um, and serve the notice. So that N4 form, a couple things, uh, really important things. It has to be filled out correctly. Yes. Um, this is something that happens very often. Is um, there's mistakes made on the the date, the termination date that people set out on the notice because depending on the type of tenancy, if it's a monthly tenancy, it's 14 days after the notice has been served. But they sometimes don't take into account how they've served it and they don't add enough days in if they've served it in any other way except for handing it to the tenant directly. So uh, just explain that for me a little bit. If I, so then if I mail it out, so I don't want to go to the house. The house is in another town or city mm -hmm. in Ontario. Mm -hmm. I mail it out. Right, I have so you have to, to add five days to the termination date and always add an extra day just to be safe. Um, and that's in the really instructions probably it that really it just glossed about over yep. about service of the N4. That's right. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the ways to deliver it are in person through Canada Post. Yep. Right. Yep. Or is it, can, I think we courier. You can mail it. Courier you can one? courier it. You have to add additional days for courier depending on how you do it. There's an express post option. Uh, there's putting it in the mailbox where mail is normally received and there's handing it directly to the tenant. That's right. I've also put it in the mailbox. One time I put it in the mailbox. This is early on. Mm -hmm. And I was so scared to do this. I literally put it in the mailbox and ran. I, know. I ran back you to my car. To, <laughs> you really have to have guts if you're yeah. serving And documents. I did it. And I think I did it at like 630 in the morning because I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, it's the only time I could get I there. And I'm like, I, I know. And I literally, if you saw me, it would have been probably look like mm -hmm. I was stalking this house because I was looking around and then I ran I up, dropped it. In yeah. <laughs> it's up. so easy if you have an apartment building because they have the, a lot of them have the slots in the door or you can oh, still yeah, slide yeah. them underneath and you just shoot them yeah. under and run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna wait for the elevator. Yeah. Press the elevator. Hurry, hurry. That's funny. But uh, okay. I, I get it. It's hard to serve documents. It really is. Most yeah, but people. then after you've been <clears throat> burned enough for you know wrong, incorrect mm -hmm. reasons. I don't mean you know someone who's a good person trying to mm -hmm. maybe having a problem with one month's rent or right. something. But someone who's really after you've been abused by someone who's really taking advantage of you, you kind of get a thick skin and yeah. you're like, hey, look, man, you know, I got to serve this yeah. because I've been screwed so many times that yeah. you, I need to do this. That's and very true. It gets a little bit easier. Yeah. But at the beginning, you, know, <laughs> you get a little petrified. Jaded. Okay, so um, <clears throat> those are the ways to serve. And those instructions are in the N4 PDF from the Ontario Tenant Board's website. Yeah. Um, so just be uh, clear on that. Any other N4 mistakes? Um, the address yes. unit number has to be the really unit clear. Unit number has to be really clear and has to match what's on the lease. I think that's right. And a lot of people, if they have multiple basement units, they haven't numbered the units, um, and they actually have to have specific numbers on those units. If there's two, it should say basement unit one, basement unit two, and that's what it should set out on the N4 notice. Because at the end of the road, if you require assistance from the sheriff, and I know we'll get to the enforcement part, but if you require assistance from the sheriff and it doesn't specify the unit they won't proceed with the eviction and you've gone all that way yeah so okay so it needs to be a one two can you do like abc like you yeah. know unit to, uh, yeah as long as it's they've designated them and they're okay. clear which ones so when you say designated designated on the lease mm -hmm. and then that whatever's on the lease matches what you put on the yes. n4 yeah but what about if it's basement units like do, do you physically need those on the door of like the unit or anything or no I've suggested to put just those little numbers on the doors. Yeah, yes, okay. it's helpful, especially okay. for if you have multiple units, and then it just saves any issues later on. Okay, and there's no cost for sending out an N4. No. Nope. We can do it ourselves, Yeah. and that gives the tenant 14 days mm -hmm. from the time. Let me get this straight. Is it for, from no, the date it's served. From the date it's served That's right. to catch up on rent. That's right. Okay, and if 14 days goes beyond next month's rent, mm -hmm. that, that also includes next month's rent? That's or right. Yeah, okay. Yep. So it's 14 days from the date of service to catch up on rent. That's right. Okay. Yeah. On the 15th day, you're entitled to file the next step if you haven't received a rent payment, oh. and that would be the L1 application. Okay, L1 application. Mm -hmm. And the cost for the L1 application right now, the last I checked, I think it was 170 bucks to If file you it. file online, it's 175 and if you... Um, file it in person it's 190 190 now okay mm -hmm. 175 online 190 in person okay mm -hmm. and the l1 form is another form that you can just google up l1 mm -hmm. ontario you know uh tenant act or ontario yeah. uh tenant board whatever you want you're going to find that form you'll also find mm -hmm. the instruction pdf for that form yeah which uh, um, i have clients that 
want just don't want to have anything to do with any of the notices and then i have clients that want to do that part and i completely understand it's, i almost it's, tell it's, someone for a new investor just do it is. yeah yeah okay. and how much is owing yeah i tell everyone just do it one time so you understand the mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. that way when you do hire someone in the future you kind of just know the moving parts That's and stuff right. and it's not That's as scary as, as you really think it is mm -hmm. but of course if you need to hire that out and we'll talk more about how you would best do that. Mm -hmm. So that that's the cost. You get the form online. Now on the L1 form, what are the most common mistakes you see on this thing? Um, the good thing about the L1 application is if you make an error in some of the parts, um, you're able with the adjudicator's uh, consent to amend them at the hearing but it's on consent of the adjudicator. Okay, I was going to say, because it's not usually... the address. It's not the address. Um, sometimes people say um, they forget and they put that last month's rent wasn't paid. And it, in fact, was. And that's part of the section that you fill out on the L1 application. So you would be able to amend that at the hearing. If it goes the other way, technically they don't have to consent to accept it, and you may have to redo the L1 application because the tenant... If the tenant didn't show up, they say, oh, well, and this I've heard, um, the tenant thought they only owed this much and now it's changed the amount. So it's going to have to be reserved or oh amended. God. So you have to really just be clear about what you're putting in there and make sure you're putting all the correct information. Okay. I, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we had one tossed once because we calculated the unpaid rent incorrectly, like the total. So yeah, this would fall possible. in the same thing where it was like yep. three months rent or whatever. And we were, I think we were off by either $100 or $10, I, oh, I forget. Oh, that seems extreme. I would have just waived it. Like, I would have said, let's just go ahead with the Okay, less than I feel like maybe it wasn't us, an investor we were working with. Way, yeah, you, but have, have you seen something like that? Yeah, I've seen people who've told me horror stories yeah. about that. Yeah. I think it's if the adjudic I think it's maybe if just your attitude in front of the adjudicator. Am I using the right word, adjudicator? Yes, the that's right. Yeah. The adjudicator. I think sometimes if your attitude is off as the inv landlord in that mm -hmm. situation, you just kind of rub them the wrong way. Yeah. And if it's like the third little error you've made, and they just kind of pile up, and they're like, okay. You're out mm -hmm. of here. So you have to be careful on mm -hmm. all of these little calculations, I find. Yeah. And the address is, an, is a non-starter, you're saying. Yes. Address is wrong. They tear it up and you're you're out. They have issues with the address. They have issues with the misspelling of the tenant's names, um, for sure. But those are basic things that you should be getting right No, anyway. I No, I know. But I've seen it. Yeah. I've seen people make mistakes on them so And much. the other thing is, is people often forget to um, cl click on the button that says that you want to uh, recover... You want them to add the cost of the filing fee into the order as well, because you can have that added into Got the it. fee. A okay. lot of people forget that. Okay. And if you forget, then the adjudicator is obviously not going to give you that when they rule. Okay. No. Okay. And yeah. then what happens if you file the... Uh, so, sir, let, let me step back one second. I file the L1. How long... Now, what happens? The tenant is notified in some fashion? Yeah. So, once you file the L1, it's out of your hands. Um, it's up to the board to serve the notice of hearing package to both parties. So, they'll send one out to the landlord and all of the tenants involved uh, via mail. And that's assumed service. So you don't have to worry about serving the notice of hearing package. Okay. And in that package, I guess there's some instructions saying if you want to pay your missing rent or late rent, mm -hmm. they can pay up and then it's over. Is then that correct? Then it's discontinued. Okay. Yes. And how does that happen? Do they pay directly to the landlord and the landlord notifies the yes. board? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that does the termination. Right. So if, the if a tenant wants to pay money into the board, they have to receive consent to do so. From, um, from the landlord. That's right. Okay. No, from the landlord tenant board. They would have to say, um, this application is being heard. I want to pay my rent into the board in trust. They don't really want to do that. So they'll say, no, there's no reason for, for you to do this. And you can pay the landlord directly. So the way to avoid the whole, the whole application process or for the hearing is to, for the tenant to pay all the rent arrears that are due and the filing fee if it's been requested before the hearing date. Okay, got it. And if they do, so, if they don't, is there a hearing date sent in the mail when those notices that L one yes. is served? Okay, and, and the mm -hmm. gap between filing and getting a hearing date, and I know in Ontario, like, you know, it's, it's it, there's been more renters, more population growth. Like, it's yeah. been a bit crazy. But can we paint a generic? I know every community. I'm hesitating because I know every area is going to be different. Mm -hmm. But can you paint a picture? Like, really, what's the time frame? Um, you're looking at definitely a few weeks. It could be more. Um, it really depends. I find I've been really lucky with the rent arrears ones that we're looking at m maybe three to four weeks out. Um, if there's multiple issues like damage or, you know, the other reasons for termination, which we can talk about if you want to, um, they're 
further ahead, a couple of months, a couple of months for sure. Got but it. You're so they're, they're streamlining between, the simple ones. Yeah, they're trying to. They yeah. give it to the junior adjudicators. And it, it also really heavily depends on the area. Okay. Yeah. So what area, just out of curiosity, what area is like, I don't know, super short and what area is super long right now? Um, I'm finding St. Catharines is taking a very long time Yeah, because right so much is going on out there. They're there probably, really they is. don't have the infrastructure yeah. to handle it. Hamilton, surprisingly, for the volume, you get a fairly quick date. Um, I was... Okay. Surprised. And what about like an area like uh, I don't know Mississauga or Brampton? Yeah, they're fairly standard. It's they've got it. Yeah, they've got a yeah, system they, going pretty good. Because they've been having such a population yeah. base for so long, they got it up. To, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, a few weeks, you get your hearing. Then when you go to the hearing, first of all, um, what are the documents that you know me, the landlord, or the landlord needs to bring with them to that hearing? Um, well, if um, if there's any dispute as to a rent that's been paid or not by the tenant, you'll want to bring some kind of proof of payment. Um, a lot of people keep a ledger and that's very handy. So uh, that could just be payments. a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet yeah. kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, a lot of people keep track of, let's say their tenant always pays by e-transfer. They keep track of those or they've printed out a copy of those. And um, So some way to show that, hey, look, I don't have rent. Right. And when it comes down to it, the onus is on the tenant to prove that they did pay it. So you might, it might come into question to you as a landlord, but it really is, uh, the onus is on the tenant to prove that. Oh, they God, paid I don't it. think I knew that. Okay. Okay. And then the lease too, I guess. The lease is important because, um, if there's any questions, um, about, uh, last month's rent being paid, normally it's set out in the lease that it was received on X date, and then they can calculate the interest that's owed on the last month's rent if you haven't got paid it. Got it. Okay. Makes you sense. You don't have to bring the lease. Um, but I always like to have a copy of it with me in case anything comes up because those hearings, the tenants always like to raise so many issues, um, that are unrelated to rent payments. So I, you want to make sure you have, I all talk the about, I shouldn't say this, but I feel like sometimes <laughs> it's like the people's court because mm -hmm. you just hear crazy things sometimes. And I remember one time I was there and someone got into an argument with the landlord or the legal representative for the landlord. And they just, <laughs> I guess they lost and they just stomped out the, you know, the back wow. of the room and then slammed the doors and oh, just wow. marched out the hall and like oh my god this is like what was crazy. crazy it was crazy yeah. so yeah if you if you're bored and you have nothing to do just find yeah. one of these and sit at the back because you can just walk in and sit at the back and just yeah. enjoy yourself for a day for the most part they're pretty straightforward yeah. and they run very streamlined but i have heard and have seen some pretty wild things happen at the toronto locations those yeah, oh really? yeah but recently they've moved locations and uh they've beefed up their security there's police there oh no so there's many police, police now yeah it's really bad Really? Oh, threats and bad things happen there. No. Yeah. Right. Yes. So anyone who's thinking about become, getting into become, become a landlord, we just scared the crap out of. No. But around, no, it's fine. They, everyone needs to know no, this stuff. No, now they're but beefed up with yeah. their security. Okay, it's so like now you're, you're safe. Totally secure. Oh, so now it's better. I was thinking yes. that's worse. No, Got it was it. bad. It's better. Okay, it was bad. But now we have the A team there. Yeah. Just uh, <laughs> OPP. Got it. Really? Yeah. Or okay. local PL police. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, okay. So you, you have those. You typically, if I remember correctly, I haven't been in a while. So correct me if I'm wrong. You sign in when you get there. Yes. You I have remember, to sign in. I remember yeah. signing in and then I just waited and I felt like it was people like you who the adjudicators knew always yes. got up there first because you would hammer through, I feel like 25 yes. cases or whatever you call them. That's right. And I was always impressed when someone like you, Kelly, would go to the front. You're all organized and they were just like yeah, running through. Yeah, you have through. to be. And the, the small landlord like me just seems to get bumped to the end because they know, I think the adjudicators know it's going to take some time. They're going to have to work through That's this. Right. And then you get called up and you could be there. You could be there for a few hours until you're yes, called up. Depends on what is ahead of you. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, because if, if one in front of you takes like an hour, right. you're stuck. It's, it's some weird situation. The other reason a delay could happen is that tenants are allowed to speak to duty counsel for free ahead of the hearing. Um, and they have to sign a list and you have to wait for them to do that. It's their right to have uh, free legal advice prior to the hearing. OK, got it. And then um, there's also uh, an option to speak to a mediator. So oftentimes um, the oh, parties Oh, that's two different things? I thought that mm -hmm. was the same thing. No, it's two, okay, different, two things. different things. Okay, that's two different things. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So that can cause a delay because um, 
you don't you might ne not necessarily reach an agreement with the mediator, but you've gone through the process to try to do that. Um, and then you don't have to agree with it. Um, but sometimes it works out and then you can get out of there really quickly. I, I always thought the mediation was really good because when you meet with the mediator, again, correct me if I'm wrong, you can come to a decision on how the repayment process, like the dates sure. for repayment process. Right. And then I thought if they didn't follow through on those dates, don't you get an automatic kind of judgment for eviction if they break that you mediated have to ask schedule? For it. It's okay, a so section still... of the Residential Tenancies Act that okay. you have to ask for. So you ask for it from the tenant board. That's right. But isn't it like an automatic approval because they've broken the... Me, uh, the There's the... still a filing process that you have to advise them that um, they defaulted on the payment plan that was set out. And based on Section 78, you're entitled to file for termination because of their default. Uh, but it is an application process and then they mail you the uh, order. Okay. So I don't have to go back to the tribunal usually. No, you yeah. have to, to file the, the request for the termination order based on the default. Okay, but I'm not going back in front of an adjudicator to explain the situation. No, unless the tenant files a motion to set <laughs> aside the order, and that sometimes happens. Okay, and they would set aside the order because they have some new reason that they want to discuss with somebody about not being able to pay. That's right. <sighs> yeah, okay. Um, and then, uh, and so they go to me, you go to mediation, you hash something out. Usually it works really well, I found, and usually everybody kind I of... I like the mediation yeah. process. I find it's, I can deal with other issues at the same time. Um, and as long as the tenant's willing or agreeing to whatever it is that we're discussing, then we can sort out other issues like cleaning up and things like I that. Found, so. the same. That's what I found I through that it. mediation process. I thought it was really good. And then you kind of skip the line waiting for your time in front of the adjudicator. Right. It worked out. I always thought really well. Yeah. Um, Sometimes the landlords just have had enough and they don't even want to, they just want to get a standard order because it's a lot faster. It's 11 days then, right? Okay. Where the mediated order gives them an opportunity to do it properly and it could take months okay so when you use the language standard order that's like no i want to go in front of the adjudicator i want to get my standard order for 11 days you're going to be out of this house that's right okay okay and that would be a case for not going to mediation because mm -hmm. i'm just like fed up some of them are and sometimes i do recommend that you don't that they don't um enter into mediation because it's just too it's gone too far Okay, so you go to mediation, doesn't work out, or you don't go to mediation, your name gets called up, you go in front of the adjudicator, adjudicator asks you some questions of like, why are you here, what's this about, kind mm -hmm. of thing, right? You yeah. go back and forth explaining about the rent. Right, it's the landlord's application, so they get to speak first, um, and basically you just go through what, what's owing on the rent. Um, they'll ask you whether or not last month's rent was received, have you ever paid interest, and then they turn to the tenant and ask them the questions about Tenant, what are you doing? Why haven't you paid? And why are you asking me, have I ever paid interest on last month's rent? Uh, because on I know an we, annual we're, we're, basis, you do have to pay interest on last month's rent. But that matters at that point? Uh, when they're calculating what's owed in the order, that if goes you into the calculation. It, they'll deduct it. Okay, from and if owed. I've missed putting that in the application, is that okay? Yes, they'll yeah. ask you and they have to account for it. Yeah, it's okay. in the tenant's favor, so they'll always make sure uh, they look sense. after and it. And that's fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes sense. If you're supposed to pay it, you're supposed to pay it. Okay. Um, so then let's say it's decided that yes, they're late on rent. They haven't paid rent. They come up with some re reasons that they haven't paid rent. Uh, it goes, does the adjudicator make a decision on the spot that, uh, Not standard always. orders? Okay. No. Sometimes do they? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they just say, I'll grant the order and it'll come in the mail. Um, they, they have actually 30 days to write the orders. Okay, and we've been in that situation when they've mm -hmm. where they've taken our stuff away mm -hmm. and had to think about it or mull it over or whatever. Oftentimes they do that so that there's not an altercation in the hearing room. Um, if there's high tensions from the tenant or things like that, Smart. they take the opportunity to diffuse the situation by saying, uh, we'll consider every all the evidence and we'll send out an order. Smart, okay, and then the order goes out in the mail. That's to right. both parties, That's the landlord right. and the tenant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other and it's 11 days from the issuance of the order. That's usually right. Usually that, okay. So if it's an issue, if the standard order to, to evict is issued that day when you're at the tribunal, it's usually 11 days later. That's right. I, and I'm just pointing this out because mm -hmm. I want everyone to know that next time you hear someone say it takes eight months to evict somebody, and there are crazy stories. I'm not trying there to say are. they're not. It's just in general, if you follow mm -hmm. the N4 is 14 days, then the L1, you're going to wait, you know, as we discussed, a few weeks, maybe mm -hmm. a month, maybe six weeks, eight weeks, whatever it is to get into the tribunal. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it could be another 11 days. That's but right. we're not talking like eight months or a year. Right. Then there's also, after the 11th day, if the rent hasn't been paid, then on the 12th day, you're entitled to file 
with the sheriff. This is a misconception. Some people feel as though if they notify the board on the 12th day that the order hasn't been complied with, they just automatically get a termination. Uh, the, the sheriff will just go and, and evict them. That's not how it works. Okay, so so I want, just so we're clear, on the 12th of the day, if they haven't left the house, if you drive by... If they haven't paid... Oh, if they have, sorry, because yeah, of course, I'm just thinking they're not going to pay. Uh, but you're right. If they haven't paid. And they're still in the and unit. And they're still in the unit. You can take your standard order to the sheriff. Right. Right. And the sheriff isn't at the landlord tenant board. Where do you go for the sheriff? Uh, well. Small claims court kind of thing? It's small claims court in the court enforcement office. And depending on where you are, it's going to be in that jurisdiction. Okay. Um, I've always found the landlord tenant board very helpful. So if you have any questions about where to go. Um, sometimes they're not helpful. I find, you know, sometimes, yeah, to be fair, they'll tell you where to go, but they'll, t- <laughs> yeah, they'll tell you where to, one way or another, they're going to tell you where to go. But Nick and I have had success just kind of playing dumb a lot and yeah. calling the landlord tenant yeah. board and saying like, here's our situation or just doing hypotheticals. Like this mm-hmm. isn't for us, but we mm-hmm. have this situation. They're actually and, not allowed. So you guys must be charming oh, really? them or something. Yeah. They're customer service oh, representatives. Done, they're not legal We've done that for years, yeah, but you know. know what? I haven't done that to be fair in probably six, seven, eight years yeah. now, but we used to do that all the time sure i used to tell people, people to did. do that all the time they give sometimes false information uh, or it's just because they're not um they, they don't know trained okay and you know it's good that you're saying that because mm-hmm. we've heard them give false information yes, where they uh, do all the time. a landlord has come to us and said hey the tenant board told me this and we're like that's completely wrong, wrong. i've heard okay. it a lot okay too. you know so since we're talking about this you know mm-hmm. where else i've kind of gotten uh like quote unquote free advice on the fly is like different landlord self-help centers. Yes, it takes a long a time sometimes to mm-hmm. get a response, mm-hmm. but I think they're doing pro bono work and there's a good one in Toronto, the landlord self-help center. If you just mm-hmm. Google it up and you send them an email, I always get great responses, but I haven't reached out to them in a long time. Yeah. Again, I agree. There are some good ones out there. You just have to be careful because it's not legal advice. It's based on their specific circumstances and maybe not all the circumstances are the same because there's so many different Got scenarios. It. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you're ju- you're getting advice, but you can't take it like a rule of law. Like here's what I was told from these guys. That's and, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's still kind of helpful. It's nice to know that exists out sure. there though, right? Yeah, Especially if you're helpful. like a do-it-yourselfer and you want to kind of get some advice. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I get the standard order. They have not paid because if they have paid, we're back to just square one. The lease is in yes. effect and we're good to go again. That's right. But if they have not paid, then I take it to the sheriff um, and the I just- The court enforcement office. The court enforcement office, wherever municipality I'm in, you find that. That's right. You go there with the order and you pay, like, so you go in you person. You fill out forms. Fill out forms. Are those forms online? Um, I don't think they have them available on the small yeah, claims. I, feel so I think like, you have to get them there. I or feel like we have if to you pick, have a legal rep, they okay. have them. We've only had to do it in all our years one time. And I think I really? had to- Yeah. Do you know how many I've done? Yeah. Well, I can imagine. You're the wow. expert. Yeah. yeah. Probably- hundred yeah yeah really right yeah some of them super easy yeah, yeah. and some of them are really messy when we when we yeah some of yeah. them are so we actually when we started working with investors we would tell them hey look if you have to go to the step and you're going to get a sheriff we will come to the property with you like i don't know like we thought we were like sure. a rambo or something but well, don't worry <laughs> we're going to come with you so i remember back going up. to this yeah back up going to with this one investor to this one property and the, and the sheriff was um supposed to pull up and i think the landlord the investor of this property thought it literally was going to be like a rambo type person mm-hmm. and this like ford no. tourist pulls up Actually. with a little kind of sticker like on the <laughs> dashboard that says like court sheriff yeah. enforcement <laughs> officer or something yeah like it wasn't even a magnet on the door it was just like a laminated card mm-hmm. in the thing and this older gentleman gets out did have a bulletproof vest on right he, a bulletproof vest the older gentleman and, I, and then i i start to panic <laughs> you're <laughs> thinking oh no i really might have to i help really here. might have to get involved here <laughs> but i now know that if they if that person when they go and if the people don't leave um because they're mandated once you go through that process and hire a sheriff to deliver you i now know a vacant possession. vacant possession that's it's called right. yeah vacant possession and uh if they have any issues they actually call the police that's right because and that made me feel better because i'm like mm-hmm. oh my gosh this guy's yeah. gonna take get <laughs> Get kicked out of this house. That's funny. And they basically, when they ask for information on the request forms, the eviction request forms, they ask if there's any chance of certain things happening. And I think they would probably send whoever based on oh, I don't remember whoever that. they have. Okay. Because they, they do ask, is there is this... Is there a tenant? Is it hostile? His, yeah, 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 violence or things like that, and animals and types okay. of things like that. Okay. So 
I think when they get the information and they say, "Oh, this one should be okay for yeah. for Bob to go out <laughs> this in the is Taurus." Last week on the yeah. job, <laughs> get the old bulletproof vest out there. All right, slap that sucker on. Be all right. Walking slowly in there, and then I remember. And uh, actually, this one case that I'm talking about was pretty easy. Uh, they ended up being gone. Yeah, and it's so good when that's that yeah. Happens, the, and he walked in, and then I think we called the locksmith on the spot. I'm gonna ask you about that in a second. And he signed a paper that you had to acknowledge that you were getting vacant possession. That's right. So is it? Uh, it's an actual piece of paper that says that this that, sheriff has delivered vacant possession of that property. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, which they makes you feel good as an, a landlord if you don't know, like their job. It's a at, real defining moment for the whole it really journey is. that you've. Yeah. Gone through to and at it. that moment, you can change the locks. Is that correct? They actually won't give you vacant possession unless the locks have been changed. Okay, is that because I remember locksmith being involved? You have to have the locks changed prior to them signing off okay. on vacant possession. So you have a locksmith on standby. That's you basically right. call the locksmith and line that locksmith up for the same time. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Change the locks. You sign the paper. Now, what happens with stuff left in the property? Okay, so if they've left possessions in the property, it's a real... It happens a lot. It does. They just leave. Leave. Yeah. I know, because they don't want to be when the sheriff gets there. Um, it's up to the landlord to um, arrange a time for the tenant to pick up their belongings within reason. Um, the trouble with that is if they're all scattered throughout the house, you don't want to let the tenant back in the house. No. You don't. So if they can be moved to a central location or into a garage or things like that, then you don't really want to, you know, enter into a situation where you might have to call the police because they, they won't leave the property. So you collect everything up, which can be, if they've left a lot of stuff, could be, a, and if it's a single could family a home, house. it could be a pain sometimes in the Sometimes it's really hard. Yeah, yeah, sometimes it's usually not, but one time I think we had an aquarium or something. Wow, yeah. And, and I think we had to figure out how to deal with it because mm -hmm. there was like live fish. Yeah, and, and then... I, you all, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, no, no. but you also have to be very careful because if you damage anything, they're going to come after You're you. You're responsible. For, yeah. yeah. So it's a really tricky situation, but it can be worked through. Sometimes um, they have, they call the police in advance and let them know what's happening. And, you know, okay. at least they're not going to be waiting hours if the tenant is not, is refusing to leave the property or something. It has happened though. So you've seen people being they get in. pulled out of properties? Yes, I have. Yeah. Wow. That's no, intense. I've is. never seen that. Mm, it's really. Yeah, that's nasty. I mean, that's just horrible. I, I just feel for their family and what they're going through. Like, I know a, a small landlord is thinking, you know, hey, look, I need rent to pay the bank and mm -hmm. kind of. But at the same time, I just feel for some of these families going through that. Can yeah. you imagine kids? And no, I've never seen nasty. it with a family. Okay, it's good. been a single male okay. people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what about if pets are left behind? Uh, that's a hard one humane too. Humane society? That's happened. Yeah. Animal control or humane society. And then you have, I mean, I've gone above and beyond to notify the tenant where their pet is because it's. Sure. It's yeah. really brutal. Okay. And I can't remember what we did with the aquarium. I think that we, would have been a tough one. That was a really tough one. I think we had to let them back in to get the aquarium. Yeah, you probably did. Um, and that would have been really long. Yeah, yeah, it was. Okay, and then the time frame, what's the reasonable time? I remember 72 hours for some reason. That's right. Okay. You have to hold on to their things for 72 hours. After okay. 72 hours, you can dispose of them. Okay, mm -hmm. so after 72 hours, and do, if I'm going to dispose of them, so I don't hear anything from them, mm -hmm. but uh, and after 72 hours, I can call 1-800-GOT-JUNK or a disposal That's company right. and just say, hold this stuff out of here. Right. Um, I have seen tenants come back after the 72 hour period and say they had flat screen TV, they had all these things that they didn't really have. Um, so I've advised a lot of my clients to take photographs of mm, quick video on your phone, something like that. Okay. Yeah. We actually had one student um, leave everything in his room. I, f I feel like yeah. the whole summer went by and we didn't do anything and then we just kind of threw it all out. And uh, we didn't know, so we got someone to throw it out, but it was like a a signed like Wayne Gretzky jersey or oh, something. No. He's See? like, I don't care about anything, but can I, I get my signed that. Wayne Gretzky? And we're like, damn, it's gone. we don't know where it is. It's gone. Right? And he was okay with it because he knew he was really at fault. But it just oh. you just felt like, no. Yeah. Um, That's hard. That, oh, my gosh. That was so tough. But uh, okay. So then okay. 72 hours. But what happens if um, they say within the 72 hours, they say, I can't come until next week? Because we've seen that situation. Sure. Doesn't matter. No, at okay. seventy-two hours, you're allowed to get rid of it. Okay. Some people have again. Then you're entering into another situation where you're listening to their story and they've already. Yeah. Taken okay. You so down. follow the rules. Honestly, That's it. it's got to be treated like a business transaction. Yeah. This is it. You've got seventy-two hours. Make the time, or else it's gone. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's my good advice. to know. Yeah. Okay. So um, 
the sheriff uh we we covered that whole bit mm -hmm. vacant possession oh the, there is a fee too that you have to pay the sheriff yeah three what is it now i was gonna say 350 350 yeah something like that okay mm -hmm. and, and we think the forms are there um you have to go in person we think to fill out the yeah, forms i don't believe that the eviction request forms are available on the ontario court forms website i don't yeah, believe okay. so. sometimes okay. you can get through to the enforcement office and they'll email you a copy okay um but for the most part, I'm pretty sure they're not on the list of Ontario court forms. Okay. And so at this point, I'm now done. I have the signed vacant possession form. We've Great. changed the locks. The stuff is either gone or if it's not gone, 72 hours. Uh, just on that note, one last thing. I'm just waiting to be contacted about picking up their stuff. Like the tenant just has to reach no. out to me. No, you should try to make arrangements. Oh, okay. Oh, you have to be proactive. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. That kind of sucks. I know. But you want it out of your property. No, you I know. Okay, so done. you reach out to the tenant. That's right. Oh, okay, and leave it, <laughs> let the tenant know. I know. I mean, I'm a and nice guy, don't. but I just I don't want to. I know. Um, okay, I got to reach out. Hey, we evicted you. Great news with their stuff. When are you coming to get it? That's it. Once. Okay, once. And what are the forms to? Can I do it via email? Yeah, sure. Okay, text, email. You just sure. have to do it. Keep notification. Keep, no keep yeah. Keep record, keep record that you've notified it. them. That's right. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So now I have one off questions on this kind of situation. You're still good for time, right? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, what if I go buy a property? We've done this before and we find a property that we're actively leasing out and we find it vacant. They've abandoned the unit. Okay. And is the, is there a form that you, I remember putting something on the door for a certain amount of time? Yeah. You can't post anything on the door anymore. Okay. They I'm changed old that. guy. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That was just um, recent, so okay. you're still not. Yeah, that oh, far not off. that old. Okay, I remember sticking it on the door, but uh, <laughs> okay. So now you fill out the form. Is it? Do you remember? Do you know what the form? Is what are you looking number? for? That like so that you I want to get saying... ownership. Yeah, they're oh, okay. it, they're gone. So like, basically, neighbors haven't seen them. It's been right. like a week. No one knows where they are. They're gone. Right. So then you have to file the application to the board saying that you believe the tenant has abandoned the unit, and they'll send you. They'll either. I don't think they'll have a hearing. That doesn't happen very often. No, we've seen it happen. Yeah. But uh, I um, think we've seen and it. then they'll deem that the tenancy is terminated because the tenant has vacated. OK. And, and once abandoned. we get that note back from the tenant board, um, You're good to go. th then we can t uh, get, get into the property. But until then, we I think we were advised not to enter. Well, yeah. I would say that to get around that, you just serve the 24-hour notice to Oh, yeah. To okay, we're coming in. You're okay. writing out on a piece of paper while you're standing there. You put yeah, it yeah, in smart. the mailbox oh, yeah. and then come back the next Damn, day and Kelly, go in. you were smarter than us. Okay. I think we were so freaked out. We just waited. Okay. Um, what about consistent late rent? Can I evict for that? And what makes what defines consistency on late rent? Um, there is a form for persistent late payment. Uh, it's the N8 form. And um, I would say that it's uh, you you would likely get notice of the board for um, considering a termination of a tenancy if they've paid late, let's say five times. Okay. I've seen people go in at three okay. and they're like, man, let's put yeah. some. They usually just put some strict rules in order. OK. And the tenant is required to pay on the first for a 12 month period or something like that. And if they don't, then you can just file to get a OK. So you can because it is kind of annoying when you're it always is. getting late rent, yeah. especially if you have your own payments to make. Mm -hmm. OK, so five you, months, maybe kind of sort of. Right. But you can't serve that notice until 60 days prior to the end of the first term. So okay. if you're in the first year, you can't serve it until the 10th month. Okay, and they, if I have a two-year lease, three-year lease? Oh, um, that's one of the yeah, pitfalls okay. of having okay. um, a long-term lease. Okay, good to know. But if it's a one-year, you know, more typical lease, one year. And it's month to month, you're fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then what about, because this one's caught us before, so I kind of know the answer, but like what about pets? Like, I, you know, they're saying... You know, we had this on like a duplex situation. No pet, you know, people upstairs really don't get along with pets. Mm -hmm. We prefer that you don't have any pets. Um, they tell us, yeah, we don't have any pets. We move them in. Day two, they get a dog. Yeah, the tricky thing about pets is that um, you're not allowed to say no pets. Yeah, you can't advertise no pets. That's right. Right. I think that's why we always use the word prefer. Right. <laughs> Thinking that that That's, somehow that was legally <laughs> legally accepted, <laughs> acceptable. Right. Um, and I know legal is just so black and white. Yeah. So for my position, it's Doesn't like matter. You, you can't. You can't even you say can't. that. But can we, but say they, you can say yeah. there's an allergy. Okay. So the only time that pets would um, potentially be asked to be removed from the property is if 
it's causing um, damage to the property or another tenant is being affected by it and you would have to prove that the onus would be on you, you to prove. and i would have to get the other tenant to write something or declare something yeah let's say it's an allergy then let's see since they moved in what's happened you would need mm-hmm. to prove it or like a doctor note you of have some to sort build a case yeah. you would have oh to build God. a case it happens oh, okay um there's also some that i've seen where um people have moved in and i'm you know, it's a duplex situation. There's children on the one side and the other dog is not good. The, Very there's common. There's a pet yep. on the other side yep. where the dog is not good with children and it's a safety issue. That's something that they take very seriously. Um, but again, you'd have to go through all the incidences and the events and things like that. And there's forms at the Landlord Tenant Board's website for this kind of stuff, I it guess? Would be, uh, it would be the N5 that you okay. would use in that case. You okay. just have to list all the events and everything. Okay. And because I got into a situation, okay, um, since we're talking about this, I got a situation where um, the downstairs tenants were just like kind of being a nuisance. So the reasonable enjoyment of the property was disturbed for oh, the upstairs tenant. Yeah. And uh, that one, this one's etched in my mind. Right. Um, I think because I went to the door with my son behind me at one point to like talk to them about like you who's living in this property. And my life, I'm like... Aiden, come with me. Stand behind your father. We're going here. <laughs> Open the door. At this point, I really wasn't scared anymore. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know the proper way to do this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but the upstairs tenant would not, like, legal, not legally, but they wouldn't declare on a piece of paper mm-hmm. that the reasonable enjoyment of the property was being disturbed because they were worried about intimidation or something. But I was getting calls daily that the reasonable enjoyment of the property was being disturbed. Right. It's a difficult situation. And that situation. was, like, the most horrible situation. Mm-hmm. I think that's actually when we... Um, first started getting legal help from you Mm -hmm. because I didn't know really how to handle it. I remember this story. And it is really difficult because oftentimes they won't grant a termination order unless they've been able to um, obtain all the details. Because if you don't have someone there to speak to what's happened, then what evidence are you providing? I think I was going to try and get a neighbor to Mm -hmm. declare something. But anyway, Mm -hmm. it all kind of took care of itself. In the end, the downstairs tenant moved out. and um, But that's a tough one, right? It is a tough one if you can't get them to go or... Um, provide some kind of statement. Yeah, okay. And then they don't really love the statements because then they, you can't question the person on what's been put in the statement. So it's not really fair yeah, got it. assessment of the evidence. Okay, but you have seen, and just flipping back for a second to sure. the pet situation about safety, you have seen those situations where an eviction pets have or, been removed. or sorry, pets are mandated by the tenant board to be removed. Yes, and okay. then most often what happens is they, they leave, the tenants leave with yeah, their Yeah, because they want their pet. Yeah, yeah. makes mm-hmm. sense. I get mm-hmm. it. Um, okay, what about, you brought up damage there. I we tell everyone, look, because a lot of people are really concerned with damage. And if you're listening to this, you should know that a lot of insurance companies in Canada now have great insurance products for landlords will, th- where they will insure against damage. I mean, you yes. pay more, that's but right. if that's like your biggest concern and a lot of new investors, that is their biggest concern. Mm-hmm. I never really, from our experience, it's not that big. It does happen, but yes. it's overall, it's not that big of a concern. Um, but if that was your major concern about damage, mm-hmm. we tell everyone, hey, now just get one of these insurance products that will cover you on that. But in the past, and what we still do is we tell everyone, take pictures of the unit before they move in. Mm -hmm. And now you can take a quick video even, but take pictures, print them off. And with the lease, now you can make fun of us on this one, initial get the 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 tenant to initial that that's the state of the unit as Mm -hmm. they're moving in so that if we do go to the tribunal we can now show before and after pictures Mm -hmm. is that just nonsense to you or no it's good you would just have to make sure that if you're gonna intend to use it as evidence because my legal mind is saying okay so um you would have to make sure that where are they initialing on the back of each no right on the picture no on top of the picture okay sure it's printed off it's initialed we stapled it with the dated yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Every page That's is great. dated. Wow. If someone brought that to me, I'd be like, this is going to be a it's breeze. It's great, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's awesome. Okay. Evidence. So that's one way to, to sure. show the evidence, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Other than that, for damage, is there any really way to, fi- you know, if a tenant moves out? I'm- yes. Um, okay. Quotes. If you get a contractor in to do quotes on repairs um, to assess, give you an estimate on how, what it's going to cost, then you can try to pursue it based on those. But don't they fight back and say, well, no, like you're getting it to a state where that didn't exist when I moved in. Uh, Well, there's usually the argument is about whether or not it was reasonable wear and tear. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But if you have the photos and it's really bad because obviously I see the worst case. Yeah. yeah. I see all the worst. But let's say I don't have the photos and I get a contractor quote. 
Right. That's, so that's then gonna it's work. going to be down to the believability of the evidence that you have and the, the judge who's looking at it because you would be pursuing this through small claims court if it's under $25,000. Okay. So uh, if it's under 25000 this is beyond the scope of the tribunal. That's right. They don't. So I don't even get a judgment from the tribunal. The reason why it's beyond the scope of the tribunal is because you said after they have vacated. If they were mm. still in the unit and you've done a property inspection and there's a lot of damage, you still... Um, would have to pursue it through the landlord tenant board. Okay, got it. Two different scenarios. Okay, right. perfect. Um, now, what about they've left, but I haven't got my missing rent? What's the situation in Ontario? Uh, I think you taught me about the term skip tracers or yes, something. Yes, I did. So, yeah. like, how, how, you know, what are my options for like? Cause, because sometimes we've seen situations where you know a few thousand dollars is missing. It's a big deal. Not mm-hmm. a few. Five. We've seen There's a lot. A lot. Yeah, I've um, seen a lot. What are my options for collecting that? Um, well, uh, hopefully you've obtained some information about their place of employment because, uh, I think we've talked about this before, we have, but yeah. it's the best way to try to recover it is through the small claims court enforcement. Um, once you've obtained an order or a judgment, um, for the damage, or are we talking about arrears at Arrear. this point? Now we're talking okay. about, yeah, missing So rent. then you've already got the order that sets out the arrears. It can be transferred over to small claims. Okay, so I take my or, my standard order for missing rent mm-hmm. over to small claims. You have to fill out the proper, and I sure. say transferred over, I know. there's always forms Yeah, and I'm fees filling and out, like, because I'm now engaging the, the small right. claims court. And, and you're selecting uh, the enforcement. Sorry, I didn't mean No, to no, no, that's good. You're selecting the enforcement that you're choosing to try to recover it. And the best one is by wage garnishment. It's slow and steady, but it's the least ris- least risky um, okay. option. Okay, and it's slow and steady because the court will choose some option or rate to recoup the rent. Uh, once the garnishee, uh, that's the employer, has received the notice of garnishment papers, they are obligated to de- deduct up to 20% of every paycheck and submit it to the court. That is unless there are other garnishments in place. And if there are yeah, oh God, ones like CRA so or child support, then forget it. You're you're not going to you're on a long list. OK, um, but, but I'm on the list. Yes, you are. But because but <laughs> after CRA is done or child support, maybe I that's right. go to number one. That's right. OK. Yeah. But if the child support is if the child's young and they're going to be paying child support for extended yeah, period okay. of time, they yeah, always come first. OK. Yeah. Fair enough. But oftentimes, uh, I mean, it's my most successful remedy for my clients, um, wage garnishment. And again, a slow and steady, but you're okay. getting a check from the court every time they um, receive money from the garnishee. Okay. And the beauty of it is, is if the garnishee doesn't um, comply with their obligations, you can get a judgment against the garnishee, yeah, against got the it. employer. Yeah, yeah. And then the likelihood of you getting it paid out very quickly is... Yeah, really most high. employers we've seen in these types of situations for different reasons over the years tend to comply because they know it's a court order and usually, yeah. unless it's a real mom and pop kind of. I've like, had a few where um, it's funny because they, they said, no, you can't, you won't be able to get a judgment against me and they refused to comply. And so I called, I brought them to task, I brought them to court and I did get an order against them and they hired me to try to get the money back from no. the previous Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they were like, what happened? Okay, can you help us get it from the, the debtor now please yeah i've had that happen a couple times um oh, and what happens <laughs> if i don't know the yeah i can only imagine all the things from all the things we've seen in real estate to this point i can only imagine all the things you've seen because yeah. you're coming in at the worst time <laughs> but uh it's amazing that you're just still, still so pleasant Kelly, you should be like just scarred at this point but uh what happens if you don't know where they work you know they change jobs because we've seen this they just kind of magically disappear mm-hmm. um who do you hire who do you reach is it to someone like yourself then for that i do um provide skip tracing service uh through my contacts um and so these are like private detective kind of people yeah there are people who have um connections that can obtain different information i feel like it's dog the bounty hunter (laughs) it's pretty much like that some of them are like that some of them are pretty straightforward but i want it to be dog the bounty hunter like can you request dog the bounty hunter yeah you call and they're like (laughs) You can only call after eight. <laughs> like, oh they go out, they'll find out. Um, but I also have used PIs depending on how much, um, like on a on a 
Um, like a contract basis if you need them or something? Yeah, where they stake them out. They stake okay, them. They follow it. them. Because it. it depends on how much you're trying to recover. And some people are really determined to get this money back. So, yeah. I mean, if they're Some people are the over the years, Nick and I, and it hasn't happened that much to us, but we usually kind of just wash it because like when we get all the costs together, we're like, ah, oh, it's really not that worth it. But some people just out of principle are like, I don't care. I'm getting this money back. Yeah, and I always have the talk with them about, you know, pursuing on principle because if you completely understand what costs you're facing and it doesn't make sense to pursue it, but you're just determined to get it based on principle, it's not always the best route yeah, to go. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. yeah. Because of the costs. That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and then what happens if you hand over the keys on a, un like a, you know, a unit um, and or a house or whatever, you hand over the keys you have some money collected, like first month's rent, but you didn't get first and last, but you have some money collected, um, and then you didn't get last month's rent, and then they stop paying you rent. Because I've seen this situation. Yeah, I've seen it too. You should always try to get first and last, of course. No, I know, but some people are just like, oh my gosh, it's the nicest family, they needed to move in right away, I gave them the keys, I took a first month's rent, and I'll come back with the lease to sign it, and last month's, and then all of a sudden it just, the door's locked, they don't respond to the phone, they're in it the happens. property. It happens um, a lot. They're now we're, we have to go to the tenant board, correct? We're starting the process uh, with so, the N4. So even with no signed lease, so am I correct in saying in Ontario that, I know there's a new Ontario standard lease agreement that we all use, mm -hmm. but even if I exchange keys keys and accept money. There's I'm, an implied contract. Okay, there's an implied contract and I'm now bound by the Tenancy Act, and the Ontario Tenant Act, yes. correct? That's right. So that's it. So the, the all this business of getting a signed lease, because a lot of people think, you know, well, I don't have a signed lease, so technically they're not in my property. If money changes hands for keys, and I think the unit has to have like a kitchen, like I don't know how they define a unit, but I remember reading at one point that like the unit has to have a kitchen and a bedroom or it's like a... Right, so um, it's only covered by the, the uh, landlord-tenant board jurisdiction as long as the landlord does not reside in the same property and they don't share a bathroom or a kitchen with the tenant got it because if they yes exactly because if yes. they do share a bathroom or then tenant then that's like something completely different yes. i don't even know what that is but it you're renting out to like, under the jurisdiction of the okay. landlord tenant board so would that be like a roommate then uh then you would be seeking the assistance of the police for trespassing and yeah. then any arrears that are owed to you you would have to pursue through uh, got it. small claims got it mm -hmm. Okay, so what uh, we've covered a lot of ground now. We kind of got yeah. to start. Yeah, this is great. So what what have we not covered that you've seen that's a typical thing? Mm, um, well, we were still talking about you saying that they've handed over the keys without getting last month. Oh, rent. sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that a lot. Um, so that's just day should, one. You're going to an yeah. N four now. No, what is it? L yeah, N four. Basically, if you've only received one month's rent, then if that month wasn't paid then you're going to start with the N4 process. But don't hand over the keys until you get the yeah. money at least. Yeah, that's what we, And not just the money. We tell people if it's a check, make sure it's a certified check mm -hmm. or a bank draft mm -hmm. or the e-transfer has gone through. Yes. Because some people we've seen accept checks, the check bounces. That's right. Right? Yeah. So uh, um, The other thing that I think would help a lot of people in understanding how to mitigate their potential losses is by, and I know this is tough because people, there's a lot of investors that have, you know, full-time jobs and they're totally. busy and they have properties in other places. But um, I find that in my experience and what I've seen time and time again is that the more absent the landlord is, the larger the problems become. Um, so, so what I do you recommend? I, we, recommend? And we agree. Yeah, go ahead. To do regular property inspections, um, you know, three a year or at least your insurance company is going to want you to anyway. And they, they sometimes have a stipulation where it's one a quarter. Mm -hmm. Now we've seen it used to be two a year. We see now yeah, a lot I'm one a quarter. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we find that as well. And we find communication. Like if you're if your tenant reaches out to you for some small repair or something, mm -hmm. we see a lot of landlords just like ignore it. Yes, we're like, you know you what, like respond, that. you know, just respond and get on it. Like, That's I know right. it's usually a pain, but just respond, like keep the communication. And that way, when you honor that type of commu communication on your side, even mm -hmm. if you can't get a handyman or the repair done immediately, mm -hmm. when you're communicating, then when the tables are turned and they owe you rent, you now can kind of sort of demand the same respect back to you. And we found that if you respect people's requests, 
uh, around that type of communication, they are, then are much better at responding to your communication. And we also tell all tenants that, hey, look, if you are going to be late on rent in this situation, we are going to start this N4 process. Here's what to expect so they're not caught That's off right. guard. But we also say, hey, look, you're saying you're going to be caught up in like two weeks. Just keep the communication rolling because if we don't hear from you for three weeks, like nothing mm -hmm. crickets, we're just going to think the worst. So please keep the communication going back and forth. And we've had some tenants communicate saying, hey, look, I thought I was going to get caught up in two weeks i haven't here's the situation i should be in another two weeks we continue down the n4 process and l1 process mm -hmm. but it does work out yes. and the only reason that the, it's worked out is because we, we've asked that they keep communicating with us we haven't got all anxious over the situation mm -hmm. and we've had that many times as long as you're still following the process which is the key you're mitigating your losses yeah it, totally point. yeah Okay, so then now who can represent me at the tenant board if I don't want to go myself? Because uh, we were joking about this earlier that Nick and I used to go with investors mm -hmm. and represent them because we used to say, hey, look, if you buy a property, we're never going to leave your side. If you yeah. have a problem, we will come to the tenant board <laughs> and we will speak to the adjudicator on your behalf. And we used to get away with that. I can't yeah, believe great. We didn't even That's know we were good. doing anything wrong. We thought we were just helping no, a small you landlord. It wasn't regulated then, yeah. probably. <laughs> yeah, we were speaking on behalf, <laughs> engaging with tenants on the other side there. It was awesome. But, <laughs> uh, but now we can't, right? Right. So who can represent some me, the landlord at the tenant board? It's if it's an owner or um, someone who's uh, if it's run by a property management company, someone who's an employee of the property management company or a legal representative. And that's, and that's, that's a licensed so the owner, the person. owner of the property, a licensed legal represent, a representative right. like yourself that's or right. a property manager. That's right. Or a staff of the property manager is okay, even if they're not a legal. They're going to ask who they are and okay. what they do. And that's okay. Mm, depends on what they do. Yeah. Okay. Got it. So if they're just if it's like, an admin person or the receptionist, no. You're not gonna but get. if they're in charge of collecting rent, sure. and yeah, mm -hmm. they might get. They might be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, what do you look for if I need to hire someone? Because like I'm like I don't have the time. I need to find a Kelly. Mm -hmm. What do you look for? What questions do you ask to get a good legal representative in uh, Ontario? Okay. Um, well, you can throw people under the bus. Just don't use names. <laughs> I just don't know because I know there's going to be good and it's bad. It's hard because a lot of them know what to say because the questions you would normally ask is, are you experienced in um, this type of matter? Okay. Um, so we have to start with the basics honestly, then. You have to go through the basics. You really yeah. do. Okay. Um, and they're obligated to answer honestly um, because we are uh, bound by rules and procedures and bylaws and all those things yeah, for honesty. Business ethics, I'm sure. That's right. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them are just starting out and they want the the. Yeah. Got it. They want the, the business. Work. Yeah, yeah, I get so it. And so they might know what to do and they might not. I had one recently where... Um, the person had reached out to me and uh, felt that the uh, location of their property was too far away. Um, so she hired someone close by and it has been an absolute mess from the start. And because this they is messed a up the paperwork? Paralegal. Paperwork? Okay. It's a licensed paralegal. And they and just didn't know the process? Or? Yeah. And okay. it's just delayed. So you really want to get a sense of, of their experience with with this specific type of matter okay um, because there's a lot of little things that people regular people don't know that can be done um, or different tactics to try to resolve it or um, things to ask for at the board or you know what's the next step do some licensed paralegals in Ontario is it fair to ask just if this is your focus I guess mm -hmm. is it your scope of practice yeah scope of practice mm -hmm. okay Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, so basic stuff. It's like, I'm just thinking about hiring like a contract. You always hear the right answers, but then when you hire them, you kind of never know. So like anything, get a referral, check them out. Right. Maybe maybe ask for a referral from them, right? If, if, uh, some sure. of their recent clients that, that you can call just to see how the process went. I don't know. Yeah, they might be bound by client confidentiality that oh, way. Oh, got but, it. Yeah, mm, okay. Yeah. Um, you can also Okay, so look roll up, the dice. Yeah. <laughs> roll the dice. You can also look up on the um, Law Society website to see whether or not there's any um, administrative suspensions or things on okay. different paralegals. That sounds creepy, uh, but I guess if you get you know, you get written up on something. the same as doctors. You know when you rate your doctor? Yeah, and yeah, You yeah. look up and you check and see what everyone yeah, says yeah, about them. Yeah, got it, got it. Okay. Or, right, there's a lot of us out there that have been doing this for a very long time, and it's super easy to do. Um, and for us, it's nothing but 
uh, there are a lot that have been doing it for a long time that have gotten by and they, yeah, they maybe okay. haven't done it the right way. Okay. So what are some of the services that you, cause you, you go beyond this, right? Can yes. you talk about, yeah. What, sure. are, what are some of the, what's your scope of work? My major focus is, um, any kind of recovery. So debt recovery for not just landlords, but also for businesses, different companies. Um, I do, um, still assist, um, some people in the auto finance world um, who have loans, auto loans and things like that on the recovery. So Oh, so it's, they've it's given basic. auto loans and people are skipping out on the payments on those. That's right. Got it. Um, and essentially anything that's handled in small claims court is my wheelhouse. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Renovations, and all those types of things that have maybe gone bad or... Okay, I don't uh, think I even knew that. So, you, so yes. anything in small claims court, That's which right. is up to twenty five thousand dollars, I feel like that changed like five years because it used to be ten. It's, no, it's more than is it five more? Five years, yeah, it's more it? than five years. Okay, so I am it's getting, old. I am getting and old. They're talking. They're still talking about raising it to fifty. <laughs> yeah, inflation. Yeah, Talk to me about inflation. I'm right. love talking about this stuff. It'll be up to a hundred thousand <laughs> before we know. But okay, so twenty five thousand dollars or less. Anything that would be handled for twenty five thousand dollars or less is at the small claims. Right. Okay. Anything that has to do with small claims. Uh, you can handle. Yeah, and it's not just debt recovery. I've done uh, return of pets. That was an interesting case um, because it was a couple and they had bought a pet together and it was a gift to her and she wanted it returned and blah, 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 blah. It's return of possession or anything that's covered under small claims okay. I handle. And, uh, you know, you give people a lot of confidence because I know I went to small claims with you with uh, somebody here <laughs> who I won't mention their name. Uh, for, it wasn't a big deal, but yeah, there were small claims and I went along for the ride and I went uh, in the chamber or whatever you call it chamber right I don't know okay and in the, the courtroom the courtroom but this didn't feel like a courtroom because we were like sitting down it almost felt like an office it was oh in so it was in one of those side rooms it was in, in a the, side yeah, room yeah it was a consultation room okay that right. was a consultation room mm-hmm. okay and we sat on each side and there was the other representative <laughs> and you were great man you just okay. like, had all the answers you were speaking with conviction I'm like <laughs> yeah you go Kelly and I and you know what just the fact that you're on it compared to some other legal representatives that I saw that were kind of shuffling through their book and mm-hmm. didn't quite have the answer immediately like you were just precise on it had the clear answer and the judge there because now it's a judge in small claims that's court, right yeah. it's the a judge. judge there really had no questions against you because you were just so clear with your answers mm-hmm. and i just like i felt like i was quiet in the background i've sat in uh different uh court cases mm-hmm. i don't know maybe this is like a hobby of mine it's for fun. people i know and i'm <laughs> cheering for them you know yeah. one time i sat in one that i was the only person it was in burlington okay and there was a case going on it was somebody i knew and i'm literally the only person mm-hmm. and i'm just kind of like making faces at the guy like on the witness stand who mm-hmm. is because he's t- talking like <laughs> lies or he's like the way he's explaining the truth was definitely different than Twisted. the truth i remember yeah mm-hmm. and but i wasn't involved directly in that but i kind of knew the situation i remember just like yeah. kind of looking i'm like you know just kind of like a little smart i'm like is the judge gonna give me crap here kind of for smirking at this guy you know but i'm literally there's rows and i'm the only person yeah. and i when uh when our guy i don't want to mention any names won mm-hmm. you know i felt like yeah you know you're doing that little yeah. cheer but uh yeah i was all by myself in the court, cheering that was it was good. good but uh okay so anything to do with any sort of um small claims re- small claims debt recovery and then how would someone um and you can also hire skip tracers and yes. these private eyes and that yep. kind of stuff Okay. And then yes. what's the best way for someone to reach you right now? Fo- uh, do you want to hand out phone, sure. email? Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. My uh, cell is 905-466-3542. And my email is khparalegal at gmail.com. Okay. Can you repeat the email one more time? khparalegal at gmail.com. Okay. Awesome. Kelly, thank you. I mean, I think we oh, just kind of gave a nice little masterclass on eviction here. Yeah. I really appreciate this. Anything no else problem. that you want to add? I think we covered what we wanted to cover. No, just use your notices that are available to you. That's all. Yeah, all, treat it like a business. Landers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Awesome, Kelly. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks you also teach me. a class here to Rockstar Inner Circle members. I it's do. like one of the so most popular. Yeah, and it's one of the most. Po- I can't believe it, but it is one of Thanks. the most popular classes. It's oh, always full. You. Everyone raves so about it. I tell everyone you're the pit bull of legal representatives, <laughs> and I mean that in the most positive way possible. <laughs> but I do think that small landlords need someone like yourself sometimes as guidance because I know when Nick and I were doing this by ourselves, we were like lost, and like we would have tenants call us and and sometimes kind of threaten us. Not anything mean, or, mm-hmm. or well, it was mean but nothing big you know just on non-payment or they didn't have to pay for x y and right. uh, z reason and we felt intimidated and we didn't know right. how to engage with Some anyone of them are really savvy and they they're know how really to work savvy the but you know what calling someone like yourself 
getting some quick advice really kind of eases the tension yes. and the anxiousness. So yeah, I've heard that. thank you Thanks. for every, yeah. I don't know how you do everything you do and stay so calm, like I mentioned earlier. <laughs> so I just really want to thank you for everything oh, you do for you. Rockstar Inner Circle members, for investors in Ontario as a whole, landlord, small landlords as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. Like it's a huge service that you're providing. Oh, so thanks very much. Yeah, I thank appreciate you. the opportunity. We'll, uh, we'll bring you back on soon. All thanks, right. Kelly. Thanks. Hey everyone, so hopefully you enjoyed that. If you didn't catch Kelly's email address or phone number, we're gonna have her contact information up at rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash podcast. So that's rockstarinnercircle.com forward slash podcast podcast. If you find the link to her episode there, we will have her contact information. She's coming out with a new website. So we'll, when we have that, we'll update that page with the website. But for now, we'll just have the contact information. Likely her phone number will be on there. So if you're tracking that down, um, that's where you'll be able to find that. Hopefully you enjoyed that show. We tried to cover a lot of ground in a short period of time. That's it for this episode. Until next time, your life, your terms. <laughs>